Hello everyone, this is Mr. Trio, and I am pleased to present the third video in our series on tackling questions of paper number one. As you may know, there are two other videos, one on question A, one on question B, and this video will focus on question C. Let us consider a scenario. First, an athlete who performs a long jump. Some water, which is being boiled on a stove. A cold winter's day. A man holding his breath underwater. And a race car. Now, if I were to ask you about the athlete, how good of an athlete is he? Then you might say to yourself, well, it's very easy to figure that out. And there are lots of different measurements in order to do that. For example, we can look at the distance in which he jumped. Likewise, if we were to look at the water that is boiling, we could use a thermometer to look at the temperature of how hot the water is. On a winter's day, we could look at a thermometer and see how cold it is. We could use a stopwatch in order to count the number of seconds that the person is holding their breath. And of course, a speedometer on a car tells us how fast a car is going. But in addition to these types of measurements, there are other things that help us. For example, there are world records. Does this athlete meet a world record or fall below it? Is he above average compared to other long jumpers or somewhere in the middle? In addition, even though people are not human thermometers, we can usually look at a um, situation such as hot water and say, is it too hot for us to drink? For example, most people like tea about 45 degrees Celsius. Or, on a winter's day, do I need a big puffy jacket? In other words, as we look at many situations, we can determine extremes by having some type of measurement that tells us which end of the scale it falls on. Now, let's look at two historical figures. On the left, we have Adolf Hitler leader of the Third Reich of Nazi Germany, and on the right we have Mahat Gandhi, leader of India's independence movement. How do we measure these individuals? Well, you could say Hitler is a terrible person, and you could say Gandhi is a great person. So, the answer to our question is, this is so easy. Unfortunately, when we look at history in the IGCSE program, very rarely is an analysis or an opinion so easy to establish. In other words, we need to look at other types of measurements in order to determine whether or not this person falls at one extreme, the other, or somewhere in between. For example, was D-Day a successful mission? Was Tsar Nicholas a good leader? Was the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese a good decision? To what extent was Neville Chamberlain's decision to appease Hitler a good decision? And was the nuclear bomb dropped on Japan at the end of World War II the beginning of the Cold War? Now, when we look at D-Day, for example, we can use certain measurements, for example, of how many people died. But we can't exactly put a thermometer into Tsar Nicholas's mouth to determine if he was good or bad. 
So what we will have to do during this presentation is try to unpack this idea of measurement. How do we look at concepts and essentially figure out a way to determine these types of extremes? Let's first take a look at our history model. As we've discussed in other videos, this pyramid helps to show the transition from very easy questions to more difficult questions. At the base is our story, our details. We've talked about how to make comparisons and how to make analysis. But at the very top, the opinion, that is really a creative exercise. Now, as a reminder, the opinion is at the very top. However, you have to base an opinion upon all the different layers that fall below it. I'm sure that many of us know individuals that go to see a movie and say, oh, this was a great film, I loved it. And then you talk to another friend who says, no, it was a terrible film, I wouldn't see that again if you paid me. But what makes one opinion better than another is if your first friend can say, I liked the film because the acting was good. The scenery was beautiful, and it had an interest in plot. If your second friend cannot back up their opinion with facts, well, the opinion essentially falls down. In a history essay, it's your job to present an opinion, but have all those good details and analysis in order to support what you are saying. C questions, as they appear in paper one, often come in three forms. The first is, how far do you agree with this statement? I like this little measurement here, in which you have five different degrees of agreement. I like five because you have a clear center, which is neither agree or disagree. And right below it, disagree, and then at the far end, strongly disagree. On the positive side, you have agree and strongly agree. If you've ever completed a survey for a company, it is usually this model which is asked. Another type of question which is often asked is to what extent? And these types of questions are often asking if an individual did the right thing. I often like to think of this type of measurement of goals. What was the goals that this person was trying to accomplish? Did they complete the goals or did they not complete the goals? By adding those things up, weighing them against each other, you might be able to come up with a measurement in which you can then apply to what extent this person accomplished what they set themselves out for. And then the third example is how successful. And this is the one that we looked at before with Hitler and Gandhi. Terrible, poor, so-so, good, or great. Once again, this is a measurement in which you have to come up with examples and often weigh those examples up against other things. I think an easy example is, to what extent was the Titanic a success? And you could list a hundred things that are wonderful about the Titanic. It was big, it was a beautiful design, it had nice cabins, it had a great wine cellar, but it did hit an iceberg. So how successful was it? Well, it would probably be somewhere in the poor to terrible range. Even though all those other things are positive, there is one thing that could make the score go down a little bit. So let's go back to our focus point, which we've talked about in some previous lessons. Focus point, fighting elsewhere than the Western Front was significant. A C question that appeared in the 2015 Paper 1 was, The Battle of Jutland 
was a disaster for Britain. How far do you agree with this statement? Now, you may not know this, but the Battle of Jutland was the largest naval battle of the First World War. In fact, it still remains the largest naval battle that was ever fought. On one side was the British Navy, and on the other side there was the German Empire's Navy. Now, the Admiral for the British said, we won this battle. And the German uh, Admiral said, we won. So then the British said, nah, -uh. and the German said, nine. Well, as you can imagine, you could go all day back and forth on this type of question. So in order to answer this, was the Battle of Jutland a disaster? We need to come up with a measurement. We need to look at different categories and find out what happened and then make a judgment about it. So for the Battle of Jutland, I essentially came up with three factors. The first factor is casualties and ship losses. The second is the control of the North Sea. And then third, aftermath. In the second and third column, I have evidence. And then in the third column, a judgment in order to essentially kind of give it a score of was it good, was it bad, and did it kind of fall in the middle. So let's look at our first factor, casualties and ship losses. What does the evidence say? Germany lost 11 ships and 3,000 dead and wounded. The British lost 14 ships and 7,800 dead and wounded. So if we were to look at this one piece of evidence alone, then the judgment is that Germany had the advantage in that they fought a better battle. And then we would have to say, that goes against the British. Maybe it was a disaster. But there's more evidence to consider. Let's look at the control of the North Sea. The German Navy returned to their home port and never again risked a major battle. Judgment? Britain maintained control of the North Sea and kept its shipping lanes open. Well, that sounds more positive to the British than negative. So I would say thumbs up. And then finally, what was the aftermath of the Battle of Jutland? The German Navy never recovered from the battle. Judgment? Britain was able to maintain its blockades of the German coast and restricted supplies and food materials from reaching German people. Well, that's very positive for the British. Thumbs up. So based on our three factors, we have one negative against the British and two positive. Where would we fall on our measurement? I think somewhere around good. It's not terrible for the British. It wasn't poor, but it certainly wasn't great either. So any response which falls somewhere between so-so and good probably is an appropriate response if you can back it up with the evidence that we've talked about. Let's begin by taking a look at how we would begin an essay for something like the Battle of Jutland. The Battle of Jutland in May of 1916 was the largest naval battle in history. Both Great Britain and Germany hoped that a decisive naval engagement in the North Sea would help tip the tide of war to their side. At its conclusion, both sides claimed victory. So all of this is our background information. It's what helps give your essay more gravitas and essentially helps you to establish that you understand the story and the basic details. Our topic sentence, however, 
is where we begin to form our opinion. Although the British did experience some of a setback with larger casualties, overall, it was not a disaster for the British because they had a superior outcome. So in my topic sentence, I'm going directly to the question, was it a disaster? And I am stating very clearly, it was not a disaster. Now, one note that I want to point out is that often questions like this will say, what do you think? As a student of history, it is proper to write in the third person, he, she, they. It is not proper to write, I believe it was a disaster. So try to keep that in mind when you're writing that history essays should be in the third person. Now, here is my full essay. And you can certainly stop the video and read it word for word. But a lot of it has been recycled from what we've already talked about. We have our introduction. We have three paragraphs, one for each set of those factors that we discuss. And then we have the conclusion. Let me read the conclusion for you. In the end, the Battle of Jutland was not a complete disaster, nor was it a complete victory. Britain lost many sailors, but their service helped to secure Britain's eventual victory in the war. So essentially, what I've done is I've gone back to the original statement from the introduction and reinforced that. All right, let's look at the last roundup. When tackling question C, one of the most important things to remember is that you have to create some type of measurement. This measurement should be able to be used as a way to denote if things were good, bad, or somewhere in between. Have clear lines of delineation. And what I mean by that is don't be wishy-washy. If you want to support something, say, I support it. Don't beat around the bush with your evidence. Make good statements. When you support an argument, try to use those categories in order to lump similar information together. And as I said, and I want to say it again, support your evidence when you can, because opinions anyone can have. But if you have an opinion based on facts, well, that's a stronger argument. And then finally, in the conclusion, make sure that you restate the argument that you made in the original introduction. Don't get to the conclusion and then change your mind about which direction it is. I hope you enjoyed this video and take some time to go back and look at A, B, and C videos for paper number one. Answers to A, B, and C that appear in this video will also appear in our Google Classroom so you can download the files directly. Thank you so much for joining me and if you have any questions, feel free to contact me.